Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of all combat sports, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, busy weekend for you. Lots of action to discuss. Yeah, I went to see Jurassic Park with my grandchildren. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> there was a lot of raptors. There was a lot of uh, T. Rexes, uh, brontosauruses. That that. Oh, <laughs> you mean the fights? Oh, okay. Yes, yes, a lot of stuff. Um, on both sides, but we are family men, so we always touch on the family. I know you were a family man this weekend, um, you know, or putting extra time into being a family man this weekend. Uh, we have to do that. And, uh, you know, life is a fight, as I always like to say. Life is a fight. You fight it on many, many different fronts, many different dimensions. And uh, I know you were... I know you were busy, you know, you're always busy. You're getting bigger and bigger. You know what you remind me of, Ken, uh, speaking about children? My kids, I bought this for them, but obviously my grandchildren. Uh, these sponge figurines where you put them in water, they get bigger. That's you. Yeah. That's you. That's you. You just keep growing. <laughs> Somebody told me, you know, your boy, you know, your boy, Ken, he he was on a podcast uh, this well, I don't know when it is because, you know, the internet is still a part theory and part rumor uh, to me. So I don't, <laughs> it's not like I'm up on this stuff. You know that. And and I don't yeah. look. So they say, hey, your boy, he was on the, he was on a podcast and, uh, you know, and somebody, he, he somebody, uh, somebody mentioned him, some guy, I, I guess it must be uh uh, a famous guy all i know is he was more famous than me obviously uh he mentioned him and and he you know he's on this thing uh podcast and he uh i said yeah that's great i said you know what one day there's gonna come a day where i'm gonna get a call that he's not available anymore and <laughs> never that, gonna happen and that he's He's moved on to bigger and better things. He got his start with me, but now he's he's blowing up so big. And I said, I hope he comes out and tells me. I hope it doesn't happen by one of these accidents you hear about sometimes where, like, you know, sometimes, like even today, the fans don't know it unless we tell them, but we're rushing, we're putting together earlier. We changed our plans because we have a couple interviews for you guys coming up with Dave Portnoy and Chrissy Martin in the next few days. So we put time, and those are great interviews, and we put time aside for that. So we start early. So I was thinking this going to come. <laughs> well, I hope to God it doesn't come a day where my boy Ken who I knew when he was just a little grasshopper, like like that Kung Fu movie, you know, Grasshopper. I, I love that. With David Carradine, they used to go across the desert. You might be too young for that, Ken. Um, no, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and they went across the desert, and then and then uh, the he was learning. He was learning from the master. He was learning. And then he's learning karate. And then one day he, he says, when, master, when will I be able to leave? He says, Grasshopper. Your time will come when you can when you can remove the fly from my hand before I even open it. When you can do that, you will be permitted to leave. And then one day he, he opened that boom, he missed the fly. And then missed the fly. And then one day, bang, he got the fly. And he was gone. And I'm just wondering when that day comes where and again, I hope it don't happen this way, where <laughs> it's early in the morning because we're, again, we might be rushing, the lights are out, you're tired, you know, you were, you were doing interviews all night, right, whatever, and, you know, Kill Bane, you know, all those different uh, late night shows. Is that the name of one of them? The only one I go back and remember is Johnny Carson and, and, uh, and what's his name? Jay, Jay, uh, what was his name? Jay, Jay uh, Leno. Jay Leno. Those, those are the only ones I, and then David Letterman. But whatever the ones are today, he, you might be on late doing one of those. And Jimmy he, Kimmel. Jimmy Kimmel. And you get up, you get up, and you know how sometimes in the morning you you do something crazy, like you put the wrong color socks on, or you put the wrong shoes on, or one, or one, one color, one the other color. That stuff happens. I just hope that one day my man Ken, my boy, doesn't get up early in the morning 
and he put on a shirt, not realizing it, and he comes on with me, and it says the Ken Rideout Show. <laughs> I just, I just, I, I, I just, I, I want to get the news. I want to get the news directly, directly from my man. This is to steal one of your uh, quotes or phrases. This is the ninjas in your mind playing tricks on you to think that somehow I've become a shitty person since you've met me. That I that we don't have the same love for each other today as we did from day one. And why would I ever do that to someone who is my friend and who has given me an opportunity to work with him? It would never happen. Sometimes I have had some opportunities to speak to people specifically about running and being able to win races at 50 years old. I hope it never and happens. Found- and speaking of me being a understand of the psyche, which I am, um, and it's been my whole life. Uh, I am a believer that you never know till you know. You never know yep. till somebody's tested. And that test comes in different forms. And it takes time. And you never know until they are fully tested. And then, and then, then you know. So I'm just praying that you will pass all the tests, my friend. And that you are indeed the person that I made this commitment to and allowed myself to make this. And I believe you are. And I will continue to believe. Well, thank you, for the, continue. Thank you for the vote of until, confidence. Uh, until I see that shirt early in the morning. <laughs> and when I see that shirt, then I will say no. No, please, 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 no. Let me be wrong this time. Yeah, you'd definitely be wrong if you think that that's a possibility with me. And all a rising tide will lift all boats. So any kind of media attention we can get hopefully adds to the value of this show. And a wider audience means more listeners. And if people are interested in the content when I do interviews regarding running or endurance sports, that they, if they're interested in hearing here more from me, here that goes, they're interested goes, in tuning in here and See, hearing what, what we have nice to say segue. about fighting. What a nice segue I set up for him. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. And speaking of, speaking of Jurassic Park, the monster was in action for a rematch One against the thing. Great Nornita. One more yes. thing. The Celtics, your love. You love me, me or the Celtics more? Me or everything you. Boston more? What, you. Me? Okay. What have they done for me other than provide entertainment? Well, I mean, you're friends with one of their greatest players, and some of them, and you talk to them regular. Um, I, I, you gave them two... You gave them two speeches before the first game <laughs> and before the third game, I believe. Um, I got them scheduled tonight, this afternoon, before the uh, game five. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, if, if you're going to give them another speech before game five, because it's 2-2. Two, two. <clears throat> this is a pivotal game, obviously. You go up 3-2, you're on the edge of ending it. So um, what, what are you going to say to them? What are you going to say to them? I think the people would... I'm going to say, listen, Boston versus Steph Curry is ob- is the obvious matchup. No one else is showing up. Draymond, trash, hasn't even shown up to a game. Forget them all. Cover Steph Curry. We get the win and get a chance to close it out in Boston. We don't want to go back for a game seven in um, San Francisco. Anything can happen in one game. This is the pivotal game. We need this game tonight. But, but Curry... I, listen, I never go against... Your, you know, your powers of, of motivational speaking, um, but, uh, and and your connections out there, but doesn't he have a partner called Clay Thompson that could kind? Isn't that kind of what makes them maybe the most prolific backcourt in the history of the NBA? That you don't have just one guy, but if that guy slides a little bit, or if you double cover that guy, uh, double team that guy, that the other guy can blow you up. I mean, isn't that a little bit that's, something? That's, po- that's possible, but it hasn't happened yet. The rest of those guys have been shut down. The Celtics' defense have been stifling. And in that last game four, Steph Curry just came alive. He was hitting shots from everywhere. I would argue the score should have probably been bigger. They fouled him, I think, on two three-pointers that he hit at the end of the game. But if you take Steph Curry out of the equation, even with Clay's contribution, I don't think they win without Steph going off again. I just, I just don't see it, but... Yeah, yeah, That's listen, I the think games. they're going to win the game. I think it's going to go to seven. I think that it's going to go tit for tat. They'll win and then Golden State will come back because I think it's about being put to the wall. You know, when your back's to the wall, that the 
best come out in these great players. And um, I, I think they both have their strengths and weaknesses. You know, obviously the offensive strength goes to Golden State. The defensive strength goes to the Celtics. Uh, so they play back and forth that way. One night is that, one night is the other. I think it goes seven. And there's, I, I, I add one thing to what you said. Well, I differ with you a little bit. Yeah, it's it's definitely Steph is a game changer. There's no doubt about that. Greatest shooter in the history of the game, uh, and undoubtedly, I, I would say. But when Golden State makes up, see, it's taken for granted that it's just offense. But when they make up their mind, and Steve Kerr gets on them a little bit, the coach, and they make up their mind that they're going to play defense, that changes the equation. That changes the equation. And I think to win this series, they're going to have to play defense. It's not just going to be Steph Curry. It's not just going to be shooting the lights out. They're going to have to. I'm not going to say they'll play as good as Boston, but they got to play defense. That's it. That's my two cents. The other thing that I would do if I were the Boston coaches is bring in someone like Larry Bird or someone who has multiple titles with the Celtics. And wear those rings in the locker room and be like, those guys got two or three rings, however many um, Golden State has. And be like, because if you're a young well, bring player your like boy Jason in. Bring Tana. your boy in. Well, who's your boy? Reggie, uh, not Reggie. Uh, Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller, bring well, him. Well, Reggie Miller's my boy, but I would bring in some of those greats and show those rings because if you're like a Jason Tatum, smart, um, those young guys... To me, the, you're, you're two wins away from having one of That's those true. rings for the rest of your life. And oh, I couldn't think of a, on top of winning it, just that ring signifying everything you've done to be the best in the world. Yeah, oh, no, you that's bring motivation. The only thing I can think of that tops that, that tops bringing in the Birdman, would be um, bringing you in. I mean, <laughs> no, really, or just Tom, walk you or, in. Walk you Brady. in. <laughs> oh, Tom Brady, that's... That, that's that's close. Oh, you know who's gonna. You know who's actually gonna speak after me. I hope he goes after me and not before me. Is the great El Presidente, Dave Portnoy, Mister Boston himself. Oh my probably God. gonna come in and get that's them fired be, up a little. That's bit. gonna be love affair when we have one uh, <laughs> uh, 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 interviewing him. Oh my God, I can I can see it now. Take us away, uh, will you, please? Um, all right. You said you went to Jurassic Park. Well, it's pretty apropos considering the monster was in action and he looked every bit the monster in deploying, destro sorry, destroying Nonito Donaire in the second round. I loved Nonito Donaire, but I think in that first fight, you described it perfectly. He gave everything he had and it wasn't enough to beat him. He broke his orbital bone. I mean, he did everything he could. And the monster wouldn't go away. And you were exactly right in your prediction of what would happen in the rematch. Uh, the monster, in a way, just blasted him out of there. Dropped him in the first with a round that with a with a punch that could have ended it. Um, had him hurt real bad before. He finally stopped him in the second. But uh, man, you were right on the screws with this prediction. How'd you like seeing the the monster in action? Hey, history speaks loud too. You know, I, I'm a follower of history. I, I have my own thoughts, my own experiences that tell me what it tells me about this sport where I can, you know, make certain evaluations. Um, but history backed me up on this one where you have a, you have a former great champion uh, or it could even be current, but you have an old, usually former great champion uh, that's older, you know, he's past his twilight, in his twilight, past his twilight, whatever, and he's in with a young champion, young, you know, good champion, he, uh, uh, in a way is maybe great, and what happens, on one night, like the great customado, my mentor told me, on one night, now in this position, and I said this before the fight, and that's what you're alluding to, on one night, the old champion he's the underdog now people don't expect him to be really to be honest the first fight went away they didn't even think he had a chance talk about Donaire uh to be competitive but on one night they can summon up the the fight gods if you will they can summon them kind of like Samson did Hercules did Samson did in the you know, in the Bible, in the, uh, where they reenacted on on different movies, where he's he's in front of those columns. You know, he's lost all his power, and he's in front of his columns, di uh, uh, 
Deliah took away all that, right? And he's chained to this Colosseum. And he beckons the gods, please give me the power for one night. Just for one night. For one moment. For one moment. And he gets them and he pulls the columns down. And he destroys the Colosseum. And that's kind of like these old champions. For one night, they get it back. And Donaire got it back for that one night. And it was, it was tremendous. It was terrific. And he fought an unbelievable fight with the great Inouye. And like I said, history backs it up. You go to the great Jersey Joe Walcott. And he was a great fighter, great puncher, great fighter, heavyweight champ. And he's, he's fighting. He's older now. And he's been through a lot. And now he's fighting the young Jersey Joe, the young Rocky Marciano. And it goes into 13 rounds. And he's winning. And Marciano gets to him in the 13th. And Jersey Joe's winning. Jersey Joe in the rematch goes in. He knows he did everything he could. Everything. He even dropped Rocky in that first fight. And he still lost. He knows he can't do any more. And he goes into the second fight defeated already. Mentally and physically. Already. And he goes in training camp's tough. And I'm going to back it up with a story from, from the late, great Don Shogun, a friend of mine who's a Hall of Fame promoter, good man, the Silver Fox. And he once told me, he was friendly with Jersey Joe, and we were talking about this, Ken, and he, he said to me, and it's, it's good to get it out of the horse's mouth, he said to me, Teddy, I talked to Jersey Joe about that fight, the two fights, and about the rematch when he got knocked out in one round. And it was terrible. It was a demolition. And he told Don, Ken, I knew I couldn't win. I knew there was, I couldn't do anything to stem the tide of this young, you know, tiger. That, that I did everything, everything. And he still beat me. And, and it was tough in camp for me to get the belief you have to have training going into and the same thing with Alexis Oguaya the great Alexis Oguaya the great champion of many many divisions he fights Aaron Pryor the younger Aaron Pryor who, who's just a perpetual punching machine a special guy too drugs got him in the end damn shame damn but a great fighter a fighter to his core special and the what a fight that was what a fight Oguaya I think was even a favorite in that one. But what a fight. I'm not sure. It was close. And then Pryor gets him. And then the rematch. Not even a contest. Same thing. Not, not even a contest. So I felt strongly about this. That going into this fight, I was wondering too. I was saying to myself, I wonder if Donaire was thinking the same thing as Jersey Joe Walcott before the rematch with Rocky Marciano. That I did everything I could. I fought, I fought a great fight, and 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 I still couldn't win. And if that did, if that defeated him a little bit going into the fight, and I wrote a quote, I want to read the quote. Ken, it was like taking a wrecking ball to an abandoned building, Teddy Atlas. <laughs> that was for <laughs> me. That's what that's what it was like taking a wrecking ball to an abandoned building because the building was abandoned. The, the, the capsule of the human being was gone. The spirit wasn't there. And also on top of it, physically, Donaire had left everything in the ring in that first fight with in a way. There was nothing more to give. So, yeah, I... I picked him to win this fight easier, much easier, which he did. He demolished him. First fight went 12 rounds. Great fight. This He demolished him two rounds. And this one was almost hard to watch. I mean, he staggered him so bad in the second round before he knocked him out. I, I was literally like, oh, dude, you got to stop this fight. He's going to get hurt. And you know, he wasn't hitting him on the chin. He was hitting him high. All this part, yep. the, They never pointed that out, uh, the announcer, but... I, it's okay, but he got hurt, he got hurt. But I thought it was worth saying to the audience, not one of those punches was on the chin area, which is usually, you know, where you aim, and that does the most destruction. They're all high, and where you do a lot of destruction, you throw the equilibrium off. 
but they're all up on the temple on the head area. Every one of them. And another thing, he took some good punches on the chin early. That's the funny thing, uh, Donet. He took some good shots, but what makes Inouye so special, he'll put them together. He won't hit you one. He'll hit you the right hand, and then he'll put the left hook. He'll finish with the left hook the way that they teach you to do. So he's technically so solid. He uses his jab to control you. He's always balanced. He's always in position to punch hard. He's never leading in. He's never out of position. He's never leaving himself available in a bad position to be counted. He's very calm. He's, I mean, he's a accurate puncher. He doesn't waste a damn thing, as I've said for years on ESPN and here. Doesn't he, Your grandmother would love to invite him over to dinner because he would f- clean his plate. You know, Ken, you know how your grandmother always wanted you to clean your plate? Don't, you, don't leave that spinach there. Don't leave that broccoli there. Finish. Clean the plate. He, he doesn't waste anything. He cleans the plate. And he doesn't throw anything unless he's in position to land it. When he has to put them together, he puts them together. He's got good eyes. He's calm. He sees what he has to see. He knows which combinations to throw at which time. And the last accolade I throw at him, he's a great finisher. I think he's the best finisher in boxing right now. When he He's Joe Lewis. He's Mike Tyson. He's Jack Dempsey. Three of the greatest finishers in the history of the sport. He's He's all of them. When he hurts you, he gets rid of you. You he do reminds not me a recover. lot of Lomachenko. He reminds me a lot of Lomachenko with his uh, flawless technique. Yeah, he's very calm. He's in position. Lomachenko is uh, probably more elusive. Lomachenko, Lomachenko, though you don't hit it in a way easy, but Lomachenko uh, definitely is more, you know, the defense is part of his offense, uh, you know, uh, he can create offense on his own, but in a way knows how to definitely create offense on the front end. That's just the back end. And Lomachenko's not the puncher in a way is. You know, he, he's a good, solid puncher, but he's not the dynamite puncher that it, in a way is. But they're both great in their own rights, uh, and they're both special. And they both see things in that ring that great fighters have to see. So uh, I, I wanted to give him his due when I think I just did. Hey, guys, just want to take a quick pause to give a thank you to today's sponsor, Athletic Greens. They've been with us from the beginning. It's the all-in-one daily drink to support better health and peak performance. If you know anything, you know that I love Athletic Greens. It's super easy and convenient to use. I put one scoop in the special shaker bottle that comes with it. Boom. Boom. Easy peasy, fresh and breezy. These guys spent 10 years with top nutritionists and doctors to create this formula. It's made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients, so it's got vitamins, minerals, all the stuff you're looking for. It's like an insurance policy for your body's health and immunity. It's all you need to stay on top of your health game, so whatever else you take, and really you only need athletic greens. Special offer to our listeners, 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get the 10 free travel packs. Again, it's athleticgreens.com slash atlas. Today's episode is also brought to you by one of my favorite plant-based products. It's Feel Free from from Botanic Tonics, B-O-T-A-N-I-C, tonics.com. Use the promo code ATLAS to save a whopping 40% off your first order. This stuff is a a natural euphoric plant-based elixir. Honestly, it's supposed to create a calming effect. I take it before I run, and I've had some of the best runs of my life, including races. So Botanic Tonics, feel free. Give them a shot. Use the promo code ATLAS, 40% off your first order. Yeah, no, that was great. And um, we'll go from one, the Japanese monster, to the Puerto Rican monster, or at least that's what he calls himself on Instagram. Edgar Belanga had been on a tear. Um, I, want, I just want to make sure I get his record right here because coming into this fight, I think he had um, won almost every single fight by knockout. One second. He was 
19 and 0 with 16 knockouts. I think 15 of them, or maybe even 15, came in the first round. He was destroying everyone. But as you would always, I think say, it was 16. I think I think at one point he was 16 and 0 with 16 first round, 16 first round knockouts. I believe you could fact check that, and I would, uh, Rob would like, to, I would like him to do that. But I'm pretty sure I can stand by that. Yeah, his last two prior to this um, prior to this Angulo fight, he won by unanimous decision. The last three, so 19. So I think he was 16 and 0 with 16 knockouts at one point. But to your point, would probably speak a lot to um, the opponents more so than Berlanga's um, abilities. He's obviously got punching power, but he was in tough, or at least in tough enough not to get a knockout with um, uh, Angulo. Alexis Angulo on Saturday night, and unfortunately for uh, Berlanga, he made the decision in the seventh round to try to bite um, Angulo. Blatantly tried to bite him on the on the shoulder and then on the neck, and uh, just a terrible look. I don't know how you come back from something like this. I really liked watching this kid, but when you do something like that, man, I just you know, I, I, I it's hard to find the words to describe when you try to bite someone in the ring, man. You just I assume he's just losing control of his emotions, and part of fighting is to remain calm, as to 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 quote you, remain calm in an uncalm environment. And he failed that test miserably. And um, like I said, I don't know how you come back from this. I'm dying to hear your thoughts. And you're gonna hear them. You're gonna hear them, baby. You're gonna hear. Give them. it to me. And the people out there are gonna hear them. And Belanca's people are going to hear them, whether they like it or not. Because I didn't commit those actions. He did. First of all, you haven't been in the game long enough to understand. You're talking as just a, a fan and a decent person. Where, yeah, uh, to your decency, where you're saying, I don't know how he comes back. He'll come back from it. He's not the first to have done that. Mike Tyson did it. Um, Andrew Galata did it. I asked Rob ahead of time to get these things ready. He will have them ready. Just to remind the fans, it has been done before. Um, and Galata took it a step further. With Galata, it was a sign of what was to come. But with all of them, it's a sign of weakness, to be quite frank. And I'm so glad you led into this the way you did, Ken. You did a good job because you, the monster, the whatever you know he wants to be called. Um, you can't be a monster when you have that weakness. See, a monster can't have that weakness. What weakness, Teddy? He's strong. He's physical. He's a monster. Yes, he is. But no. The inner strength. You have to have that. The core strength. The spiritual strength. The strength of spirit. The strength of will. The strength of belief. The strength of character. You have to have that strength to really be a monster. That inner strength. Not just the outer strength. He doesn't have that. Not now. And he proved it. He proved it by doing that. Because when you do that, you're looking for an out. You're looking for help. The, the guys with that monster strength, they know where the help is themselves. They don't have to look outwards. They don't have to look for help other ways. They, they don't need to do that. They, and he showed by doing that. And now listen, there's going to be some people uh, that someone said to me, some, tell it, it'll be over the head of some people. I don't believe it. I believe that you, our fans are that under smart. I do. I do. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I really believe that. I believe that they this will. They might not have thought of this, but once you give it to them, they're going to understand. They're going to contemplate, and they're going to digest it, and it's going to ring true. They're going to say, yeah. You know why? Because they would have seen it somewhere else in life. Doesn't have to be just in a ring. They would have seen it somewhere else in behavior, in life, in bullies. Bullies are weak. Bullies aren't strong. I don't care how much weight they pick up in the gym. You know, I don't care how much steroids they take or don't take or uh, whatever uh, supplements they take or don't take and how big they are and how, and how they growl at you. They're not tough. They're picking on the weak because that makes them feel, that bullies them. That gives them something they're missing in their mind. That makes them feel more complete. And if you need that, you're missing something serious. You're missing something. And I want the parents out there that have children that are bullied to hear this. To hear this. So you can tell that to your kids. 
and explain it's not their weakness, it's the bully's weakness. So I, I want to, this is important. We can teach a lesson here that when you do that, yeah, he was frustrated. Yes, yeah, he was this. They were, but he's weak because he's looking for something rather than himself. He's not a monster. Rather than himself to be strong. He's, he's looking for someone, something else to help him, to, to maybe make the guy quit, to intimidate the guy. You know, something, something other than himself to get him out of this jam with a guy that, yeah, he's winning, but the guy's still there. The guy's threatening him. The guy's not cooperating. The guy's not disappearing like 16 other guys. And he's not mature enough. He's not built enough. He's not tough enough. He's not developed. And I'll tell you one other thing. I don't know. I, I, I believe my, our fans will, will understand and, and enjoy this. Understand it. Even use it. But I don't know that his people will, Ken. I don't know. Because for two reasons. One, they just might not know and understand it. Two, they might not want to know. Because to know, you got to say what I'm saying. And you know what? People don't like to hear that if they're guilty of that. And you know what that means? It threatens your position. You know what that means? You might not get a paycheck. Yeah. That's what it means. And that's why I only work with certain fighters. Because some of them don't want to hear that. But some do. You know why they do? Because they know sooner or later they're going down that dark corridor. And they need a light. And they want somebody to give them that light. Because they know sooner or later it's coming. That day is coming. It's coming. No matter how you try to push it away. And it's coming for him too. And he showed a weakness. He ain't ready. He ain't the monster. He showed and that's going to be worked on. And he showed the same thing Tyson when he bit Holyfield. He did it because he, he wanted to get out. Because he figured maybe it intimidate Holyfield. Big mistake. Big mistake. <laughs> Big mistake. What, what's that movie? Big mistake. Big mistake, right? Uh, he thought maybe, or maybe the ref will stop it. That's a way out too. And he did. He did. Maybe the ref is out. He got disqualified. But whatever, he felt really, really. I know people are lovers of Tyson. And I get it. I love Tyson too. In a different way than you people do. In a different way. You never understand. You never understand. It's got nothing to do with hate, with hate, you imbeciles out there that automatically will jump to that. Jump to, because you got nowhere else. You, you, your mind's not expansive enough to understand beyond, oh, it's got to be hate. No, no. How about it's the truth? How about it's an understanding of something that you just don't have a grip on right this second? Maybe, you know, instead of understanding, right away you jump to hate. And Tyson just didn't. He did everything he could in the first fight. And Holyfield still was there, took his punches, still was there. And he broke him down. And he went into this fight desperate, knowing he needed an escape clause. He needed a plan B. He needed a parachute to get out of there if it got to that place again. Because he didn't, he didn't have the fortitude inside himself, the belief inside himself. He, he hadn't built that up. He built up strength and power and quickness and, and, and ability to finish somebody and tremendous fighter. Tremendous. But he hadn't built that up. He hadn't built that up. And it's, that's why he did what he did. And then Galata. A lot of people don't know about this one. But, or they forgot. Galata, before he fought Riddick Bowe, see, it was a sign of what was to come, his weakness to come. It was. It really was. Like a weatherman saying, you know what? Those cumulus clouds are telling me that there's going to be a storm. That's what it was. For me, it was a sign of what was to come. He bit a guy. I think his name was Samson Poor. I asked Rob to get it. He'll get it up there. He bit Samson Poor, Ken. Uh, most people won't recognize that but it was on his way up I forget what fight it was but it was before he fought for the title against Riddick Bowe and Galata was a talented guy he was a talented fighter he, he strong physically and very he knew how to fight and yet he bit poor because again 
Paul wouldn't cooperate and wouldn't disappear. He was still there. He was strong. He was still, so he bit him, bit him in the neck, bit him in the back, where, wherever the hell it was. And then he fights Riddick Bowe for the title. And he's beaten. This was insane. Well, I remember this he, like it was yesterday. Yeah, Ken. He's beaten. I, I mean, who, where else are you going to get this stuff on a on a on a show where where people are going <laughs> to delve this deep and and really doing as we promised a years ago, year ago, whatever it was, where I said we're going to be the cat scan. We're going to be the cat scan. We're going to break it down. And he's in the Riddick Bowl fight, and he's beaten the hell out of Bowl. He's winning a fight. He's going to be the he's going to be the heavyweight champ of the world. And what does he do? He hits him low. Then what's he do? He hits him low. And then what's he do, Ken? He hits him low. <laughs> and and it, it was the most irrational behavior, as as irrational as anything I've seen. A hundred percent, Ken. Unless it's rational, unless it's rational, it depends where your point of view is. It depends where you're standing. It depends what dimension you're in. It really does. Because it's rational to him if in his mind, even though he's winning, the guy's still there, the guy's still a threat, and he don't think that he, I'll get right to the point, he don't think he's tough enough, he don't think he's equipped enough, I mean, you want to use the word man enough, go ahead, I don't care, but whatever, I'm not even trying to go there, but he doesn't think that he's tough enough to deal with this guy, so what does he do? He hits him low. Really? Really? And then if you don't believe me, fans out there, okay, fast forward to the rematch. Fast forward to the rematch. He'll never do it again, Ken. Never, because it's not rational. But we're not talking about what's rational in a rational world. We're talking about what's rational in an irrational world. In a world where fear takes you over. Where lack of confidence drowns you. Chokes you to death. And the football coaches out there, I got one I'm thinking about right now. Uh, great football coach. Great. Al Washington, he's with Notre Dame. Ken, you heard of Notre Dame, right? It's a pretty big school, right? He was with Ohio State. Now he's with Notre Dame. Not only have I heard of him, they just knocked Tennessee out of the friggin' College World Series. I was like, oh, we're bringing good luck to Tennessee, guys. My kids were loving it. And Notre Dame, ugh, sorry about for lack that. of a better term, sorry. beats them and sorry about uh, goes it. to the World Series. Uh, uh, I'm <laughs> sorry about that, kid. But, you know, you can't win them all. You're on a pretty good streak. But you can't win them all. But Al Washington is the, now is the linebacker. I believe he's linebacker coach. But he's a coach with, with Notre Dame. And I think he's going to be a head coach one day. I think he's special because he's, he's willing to explore these, these areas I'm talking about. These areas that are not of the norm for everybody to explore. Most of the physical areas, the technique, you know, the physicality, the bang, bang, you know, that, that's the area. But to go, to go, to be willing to submerge, to get in a submarine and go underwater, because you got to go underwater to get to these places, and to want to get to these places to help his players more. To get to these places where, as you said earlier, the ninjas can come, as I use that phrase, can come over the walls and they can attack you. And him and other coaches, I know there's other coaches out there too, whether it's football. That, what I'm saying, it's about life. It's, it's about everything that there, is, that there is a threat involved in, that there is resistance, that there, there, there is something to overcome whether it's a board meeting and you're scared to death to get up there in front of the board meeting and your boss and the vice president and the CEO and the COO and the CFO and the CK Kiko, <laughs> oh, and the, you know all those guys because that's you know, that's your world. I mean, and you and you're scared to death. You you're worried that you're not going to be smart enough and you're, it's not going to be enough for you. And and the ninjas come, or you put a wall up, or you do preventive thinking, like I'm talking about now, where you learn. You learn where this stuff's coming from. And then you have a plan. You have a plan to control it, to defeat it. And there are, I, I'm telling you, there's football coaches, there's, there's coaches in MMA, there's, there's coaches in, in all the different sports, and like I said, different vocations out there where there is some though that they want to hear this. 
This is important. They asked me to come speak at, at different seminars, most of them football and, you know, where there's a parallel with the boxing and overcoming stuff. But you'd be shocked in your world how many people have asked me, can you, can you come into that world and talk about it? And it's for this reason. It's for just what we're talking about here. And Galata, he went into that rematch, as we just said, you figure never again. Well, it was again. What does he do? Same thing. He's hitting, he's winning the fight, and all of a sudden he goes low. And it caused a riot in Madison Square Garden. I believe that's where there was the second fight because I was there. I was there with my man Larry Michaels, one of the best play-by-play guys in the business in any sport, boxing included. I think a few places should look at him, to be quite frank, if Bob Poppin isn't busy too. Um, But uh, I I think who's another great one, but I think they should look at it, Larry Michaels. I was doing, Ken, you didn't know this one. Al Michaels, Al Michaels, not no, Larry No, no, this was, this was Larry Michaels, not Al. Oh, sorry. Al Michaels already <laughs> the king. Larry Michaels was the president, the head of CBS Radio at one time, the voice of the Washington Redskins. I gotcha. He was the man who came in when my partner, Bob Papa, or whoever I was working with, Pop- Papa was the main guy, uh, at ESPN years ago, he would come in when they weren't available, and he did a great job. But me and him did something people are going to be shocked when I say this. We used to do HBO radio in all the HBO fights around the country. Wherever there was an HBO fight, I don't know how long we did it, two, three years, whatever, we did the radio, like the old days. We did the radio, and he was my man. And that night, in the second Galata Bow fight, I believe it was the second. It couldn't have been the first. It was the second. But it was at Madison Square Garden. We were there. We were there broadcasting live when the riots started, and and it was crazy. It was crazy because after he did him low again, uh, this time... Bo's people went nuts. They were, they said, that's enough for this. And the corner went after them, and, and all hell broke loose. I remember Lou Duva, my friend, the great patriarch of the of, of the Duva family, great ambassador to the sport, great, great, you know, mind in boxing. Um, I remember he was carried out on a stretcher because uh, they thought he was having a heart attack, which I, I think he might have been having a slight heart attack. God, thank God he was okay. Um, and he wound up living to be just about 100, just under 100. Um, but that was, nobody would have thought that we could have that kind of night, Ken, after the first time he got disqualified. But again, again, the domain of the mind, so unknown. Everyone knows about the body. You know, and and how you have to build that up and how you have to do special sprints and special exercise, explosive this, explosive that. But the mind, without that, you're you're done, my friend. You have nothing. Nothing. You're a ghost ship and you don't even know it. Out on the Pacific, the Atlantic, whatever ocean you want, and you're just floating around. Indian Ocean. (laughs) <laughs> all of them Ken's ocean he's got an ocean in his backyard I mean some people call it an ocean <laughs> I mean I know it's really a lake but some people call it an ocean it's that freaking big it's that freaking big so that's the point and bolanga has got a problem because it's showing itself now this I'm, I'm, I'm being I'm a doctor I'm the fight doctor right now okay yeah, I'm not afraid to say I'm not trying to do this or don't brag or act like an idiot but yeah we're making a prognosis <laughs> yeah yeah that that's a symptom and if you don't treat that symptom if you're not aware of that symptom it'll lead to something worse it'll lead to something worse that's all i'm saying and that's the point and and then i'll finish with the analysis the physical analysis yeah obviously he had 16 and 0, 16 knockouts they got him 16 Doormen, okay? Um, to say the least. Uh, uh, doormen. And listen, doormen in are tough. In hindsight, some doormen, in, in I don't hi- want to insult doormen. Some doormen are tough. 
I don't want. But in still. hindsight, it's in, in hindsight, it's very obvious that they weren't of the caliber of his abilities because he's in now with Angulo, who's been in there with a few people, and he can't get him out of there. And, and try, Angulo's thirty eight so years old. Thirty eight years exactly. old. Exactly. And and he's been exactly. stopped once by by Benavides, but still. But and he fought two big fights. Those are two big losses in title fights, or with title guys, with top guys. Those are two losses. But Angulo was 38 years old, and he's a slow, plodding guy that's one-dimensional. Coming in, he should have been made to order, especially if you're the banger. You're the vicious monster. And it's on Puerto Rican Day Parade weekend in yeah. New York. It was a showcase to give him an opportunity to that's like, why destroy they picked this, this guy. guy. Yeah. They didn't make a mistake. The mistake was not understanding and evaluating their fighter to this degree because most people can't. Most people don't see that. But, and don't understand that. It never will. But I tell you, Ken, they had, the, the problem is when you're 16 and old with 16 first round, you never develop the things I'm talking about. You never have to go into those dark rooms and find the light. You never have to mature, to develop, to get tougher, to develop. Uh, yeah, your biceps and everything develop and all that crap develop and your footwork in the gym and everything. But this part, the mind part doesn't develop without resistance. And there's no resistance in those fights. Without turmoil, without going through something, without overcoming something. And he didn't have to do that. And and I'll tell you another thing that it gives you a wrong sort of slant on or a wrong um, thought. It leads you the wrong way, that he's the great, 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 great puncher. It doesn't mean that. It means you put guys in front of them that didn't have a great, great, great chin <laughs> and weren't great, 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 great defensive fighters. <laughs> That's part of it. I'm not saying he's not strong and he can't punch, but he's not that. He's not George Foreman. He's not that. He's not even better Venus. He's not that. So that's all I'm saying. But you get misled. Because they want to mislead you. Because the promoter and the manager want to build a monster. Because that makes money. If you haven't noticed, what did I tell you? Where was I yesterday? I was at a movie watching Jurassic Park with my grandchildren. That's what sells. Monsters and dinosaurs. <laughs> Monsters and dinosaurs. By the way, Godzilla, part dinosaur, whatever, he's considered a monster too. So that's... That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make money and sell. And you know what they got now? They got a guy who boxes on the outside. A guy that had a 38-year-old, slow-dimensional guy. And you know what he chose to do? Play it safe and box. Some people say he played it smart. Okay, I, I'll, I'll go with you, Ken. I'll go with you. But you know what? That's not what he, they built him on. That's not what people are tuning in. That's not where his fan base is coming from they're coming from the monster they're coming to see him destroy guys to fight with that kind of passion too with that kind of confidence not just the power but with that technique with that style with that attitude not a guy who's going to move around and box his way to a decision in a safe way you know what if they want to see that there's better guys at that to watch there's guys out there fully invested in that style that are better at it that's who they're going to watch. So they better figure it out. So anyway, they changed trainers after the fight before this with Rolls, which I thought was a good move. They, I thought it was a good move. They, the guy, he wasn't getting better with those guys that he was with. He wasn't getting no better. So they changed trainers. Now they're, now with, they're with, I think, Juan. Uh, Juan de Leon. Yeah, Juan de Leon. Thank you. He's been around, and his brother was first Carlos. Time, first time with them, yep. And his brother was Carlos de Leon, four-time cruiserweight champ. Hell of a fighter. Hell of a fight. So he's been in the fight game his whole life. Obviously, right? Uh, it's in his blood. So they're, they're trying something new. And it, uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We'll watch. Well, you know who de Leon used to have? Alberto Machado, who beat our friend um, Andrew Cancio. Oh, okay. Yeah, he did have Andy, him. And Andy had the heavyweight contender, baby Joe Messi. Who used to fight on ESPN on my air when I was doing the fights, all of his fights basically on his way up. 
all of his fights on his way up. And, you know, he was a prospect. He, they were trying to build him up. Uh, you know, they were being very careful with him. And then he had an unfortunate situation where he got a brain bleed, Ken. Uh, baby Joe Messi. He was from, he was from uh, Buffalo, New York, Rochester. Up One in- quick thing. Sorry. I, I said he beat our friend Andrew Cancio. That wasn't Andrew. Andrew beat Machado to take the title, then beat him in the rematch, then someone else beat Machado, and then Andrew lost the title, and I'm spacing on the name, but I apologize. Andrew beat Machado. Yeah. Andrew Cancio did. Sorry about that. So oh, go ahead. No, he had a brain no. Uh, Joe Messi, he was fighting on ESPN, and they... I got myself into a situation where he he was in a fight where he got hurt. And he got, you don't recognize these things right away, Ken. Sometimes they're, they're obviously subliminal. They're under the surface. And it takes time for the symptoms to come out. And uh, anyway, they came out and I'm trying to, it was a long time ago. We're going way back, years and years and years. But the bottom line is, that he had a brain bleed and he wanted to come back, you know, after a little time away. And I, I've, I resisted it. I, I used my platform at ESPN because I thought it was, I thought he was risking his life. I mean, you get in the ring, you could argue you're risking your life anyway, but when you get in the ring damaged, compromised already, you could also say that you're, you're playing Russian roulette. And I don't think anyone should play Russian roulette with their life. And so I, I fought against it. And they didn't like it. The father didn't like it. The kid was a good kid. I think he went into politics. I don't know what happened at the end. But he was a smart kid. He knew how to talk and conduct himself. And um, I think at the end, he might have quietly been grateful. I don't know. But I I fought it, Ken. I used my, as I said, I used my platform at ESPN to say he shouldn't fight. Talk to neurologists. You got to remember, my father was a doctor. Um, I, I he, they all said, Teddy, you, once you once that's been compromised, where you have a brain bleed, no, it shouldn't come back. So I, f- I went and I was resa- at the end of the day, I, oh, it kept him. I think it kept him from coming back, or it curtailed his comeback. Where he might have had one fight, but maybe I don't even know. But basically, that was the end of it, and um. And I hope he's had a great life. But the most important thing is he's had a life. Because what what really made me feel that I did the right thing was, I forget how much longer it was, but there was a some period went by and he was saying he was okay. And then he was in his house, obviously doing what you do in your house, whatever, not in a boxing ring, and he collapsed. And that was enough for me. That, that was enough right there. And... You know, they they wanted maybe, hey, listen, I don't want to take anyone's livelihood or dreams away. Of course. I, I mean, I felt, I, I thought about it very hard because you're taking someone's dreams away to be champion, to be a heavyweight contender, to be all those things and to make money, but most important to accomplish those things. And, you know, you, you're the person that might be standing in the way or partly standing in the way of that. But again, nothing trumps life. Nothing's more important than life, the gift of life. Well, Teddy, that's actually a good segue into a, a recent unfortunate incident in the ring. South African fighter Simcio Puthelizi, um had a fight uh, within the last week. I, I think it was in South Africa. And um, he came in and hurt the opponent. Uh, into knocked him into the ropes, but as he was falling into him, it looked like the opponent who was getting knocked into the ropes clipped him with a perfect shot on the jaw. The but but there's 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 so it's, it's so the so South funny. African the South African kid he's hurt but the ref seeing the other kid knocked into the ring so he's not paying attention so they separate him the kid gets out of the ropes and the ref tells him to fight and Butelas he turns towards the ref and starts throwing punches at it like a phantom boxer he's clearly like compromised and um you know I 
I don't want to be too harsh on Bradley and Tessator because they made light of it, but they didn't know that the kid had died. He actually suffered a brain bleed and died like within days afterwards. They never and would have uh, said it if they knew that. And Tim and Tess had uh, made light of it, and that's the only reason why I know the kid passed away because they came on after the break and um, apologized for uh, making light of the fact that this guy was obviously compromised badly with a head injury. But man, so sad. To your point, is like. You're only one shot away from serious damage and a brain bleed in boxing is no joke. We've seen it time and time again uh, recently with Max Dedeshov, there's Patrick Day, there's a number of cases. And Ken, there's symptoms because when you see a guy doing that, at the very least, he's severely concussed. He's out of it. You know, he's, um, he, he's, he's basically semi-conscious. He's out on his feet. He doesn't, he's not in control of his actions. Or of his mind, of or cognizant of what he's doing. So he's already compromised. So there are that that's the signs of that. A guy ain't doing that because you know he's uh, <laughs> uh, because he he wants to show he's okay, or because he's he's you know he he's trying to make people laugh, or because he's you know he's not doing that for any other reason than he ain't right. He ain't right. See, I've seen it up close. You could, I've been in this business 50 years. And I've seen it up close. I remember seeing a kid in Gleason's gym. That matter of fact, the, the funny, the father, God bless him, he's not here anymore. But he uh, he used to bring his kid to the smokers in the Bronx, in the South Bronx when he was 10 years old. And I brought my kids from Catskill. One of them later became a kid named Mike Tyson. But I took him down there to get experience, to get fights and these smokers down in the South Bronx. Actually, you know, let me just jump in for one second because if people want to hear more about that, they should check out your book, Atlas, From the Streets to the Ring, A Son Struggled to Become a Man. And in the book, you discuss everything to do with the how you met Mike Tyson, how you took him to the smokers. Then obviously it goes into a million other topics, but that just for people who are interested in hearing more about those stories... I can't recommend the Audible book strongly enough. Thanks, Ken. Carrie, I'm sorry about no, that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so we, I would take them to the, you know, we, we go to the smokers, and the father of this kid, I'm, I'm going to not say his name, but the father of this kid, he he used to bring his kid, this kid, to the smokers. So he, we went back many, many years. And now the kid's no longer 10 years old. He's grown up. He turned pro. He was 1-0. I believe he was 1-0. I'm not sure. He had won the Golden Gloves in the amateur New York. He was a good prospect. He really was. I think about 140 pounds, 35, 40 pounds. Good puncher, good fighter. Good amateur experience. He started young. And he's, he's in the... It's funny. His father had wanted me to train him, actually. And it didn't happen. But, you know, he, he had that in his mind. So we're in the gym. He's training. He brought his son to train in the same gym that I'm in, Gleason's. At that time, I started with Gleason's in Manhattan. By this time, we had moved to Brooklyn. And he was training with a with a really good old trainer uh, that was a friend of mine, Victor Valley, uh, senior. And and uh, he was a good fighter back back years ago. And and he was a good he was a good smart trainer. He later trained Jerry Cooney, Billy Costello. Billy Costello won the junior welterweight title with him. And so anyway, he's he's in a ring, and there's three rings in Gleason's. So I'm working with my fighters, and then there was a little break. There was a little break where I had a little break with my fighters, so I'm watching the sparring, which you often did. You watch somebody spar. So I'm watching in one of the three rings, and this kid is sparring with somebody, Matter of fact, he's got a fight coming up, and he's sparring, and he don't look that great. He's a good fighter, but he he, he looks like a days ago. He looks off, and Victor's getting on him. Yeah, come on, son. You know, yeah, you, you got to pick it up. You got you, you come on. You got to wake up here. You got to, and all of a sudden, I'll never forget this, and it's it's so vivid, and. Somebody else saying it's so unusual, and it was unusual for anyone, but in the boxing business, you get to understand the unusual and what it means. And all of a sudden, Ken, he comes back to his corner, and he starts talking, 
And I'm telling you right now, this is what it sounded like. I mean, his his words were blurred. They couldn't come out. They were contorted. And and of course, Victor's looking at him like, son, what? and everyone is shocked and, and scared, but shocked. And, um, and then he collapsed. And we took him to the hospital. I remember staying all night at the hospital with him. He wasn't my fighter, but I knew the kid, as I just said, and I felt I wanted to do that. And his family was there, and other people were there, of course. Uh, and I remember staying all night. And what it turned out, he had a brain bleed. That's what happened. And it was going on for two days. And thank God, they, they thank God he survived it. They did what had to be done. Um, and I, I, he survived it. You know what I mean? You don't always survive it. and But he did. And obviously that was the end of his career. But thank God it wasn't the end of his life. And and I just, you know, I, I, I remember, it just, when I see these things, like I said, the, there's always a warning. There's always some. And here's the final part I got to tell you. Where'd it come from? I told you it was two days. He wasn't sparring two days earlier. He wasn't, uh, where'd it come from? He never took a beating in the gym. This guy was a good fighter. This guy was a good fighter. Where it came from was, it turned out, I believe, if my memory serving me correct, he slept in a bunk bed with his brother. And he fell out of, I, he was in the top. And he fell out of the bunk bed one night. And obviously, you know, he got up. He, he It's in the middle of the night. He, whatever happens, he feels okay. He goes back to bed. It happened right there. And a lot of people that want to criticize boxing, and I get it. And they want to criticize MMA and all that. I get it. It's a tough sport. It can be a brutal sport. But sometimes there's other things that happen, underlying things that, you know, that people aren't aware of that happen. And I know of several of these situations when it came to these kind of unfortunate, uh, terrible uh, things that obviously were tragedies in the end where someone thought the fighter got hurt in the ring but where it was a previous undisclosed injury as Customato used to talk about where nobody knew about and sure enough two days before this kid fell out of a bunk bed obviously right there right there he there was the start of the bleed and then two days later he's in the gym and it shows itself and we think it's boxing but it wasn't. It was that. So anyway, um, just really putting light on that for everybody out there. And, uh, you know, our, our prayers are with the fighter that, that did not survive. Uh, our prayers are with him and his family. Uh, terrible tragedy. All the fighters understand the risk going in. They do. They do. But it still doesn't change the fact that when it does happen, um, it's it's just, you know, devastating, devastating. Uh, so that's why I always say fighters can't make enough money in my book, Ken. They can't make enough money. They can't. You know, oh, he's greedy, he's getting this. No, he's not. Let him get it. Get as much as you can because of the risks that you take. And because, like I said on ESPN for many years, and now some other people are using that, that saying, yeah, it's, all right. Well, it's all right, I share I share. I'm not, I'm not, I learned how to share. But uh, I always would say that saying, that when you get in the ring, on any given night, you're getting out of the ring with less than you brought in the ring. Yep. Yep. Perfectly said. And uh, before we segue into the UFC, I just want to remind people if they'd like to learn some of the bossing 
boxing basics. Please check out Dynamic Striking. Go to Teddy at search Teddy Atlas on Dynamic Striking. You can um, see Teddy's tutorial videos that he made for uh, Dynamic Striking. Goes over all the fundamentals: boxing, uh, jabs, uppercuts, all the different jabs, uppercuts, right cross, left hook, whatever it is you're looking for. You can learn it all there. And then to get yourself geared up, check out the Box Raw 36 collection. Go to boxraw.com. Search the Teddy Atlas 36 collection. 36 minutes to make life fair. Um, you know. Know, level playing field once you get in the ring all nothing else matters so uh, please check out box raw uh teddy atlas collection teddy let's get into some ufc action they brought the heat again this weekend the entire main card was a barn burner i loved every second of it let's start out with uh the monster herself another monster joanna janchacek the uh, Polish fighter, been around for a long time, done a lot of great things in the ring. Unfortunately, Wei Ling Zhang knocked her out with a spinning back fist, just beautifully timed, perfectly executed. And uh, unfortunately for Joanna, she got face planted with the KO and retired in the ring after the fact. She's had an excellent career. She's, uh, you know, she was almost to a certain extent the Conor McGregor in terms of trash talking uh, of female fighters. She really uh, got in the head of a lot of opponents, uh, but not Wei Ling Zhang, who wasn't having any of it and just beat the brakes off her all night long and then ended it with a spinning back fist. How'd you like that one? Well, first of all, I'll, I'll refer to her as Joanna, if you don't mind. I, I agree. I, I, won't, I won't go <laughs> down that road um, and embarrass myself more than I have to. So, um, Joanna versus Wiley. Well, if I'm not mistaken, it was a rematch from a few years ago. Where that's correct, and uh, Joanna fight. got her head, her head swelled up yeah. like almost like ET yeah. or forehead. I've never yeah. seen it since. I've never Tobin. seen an injury like that. Yeah, yeah. it was a hematoma. I I've seen them. I seen one with. Uh, Rockman against the Holyfield. I, Hasim I, Rockman. Yeah, yep. yeah. I, I, I saw that. It might have came from a headbutt. Who knows? But uh, this one looked different, though. Her entire forehead. Rockman had that one thing on the side of his head. Joanna's whole head looked like it was swollen. It was. It was scary looking. No, it was. Yeah, you're describing it accurately. Uh, so, and and that was a great fight. That was that was a like an epic fight some people say it was one of the greatest women fights ever uh yeah and it, it wound up with wiley winning a tough fight so this uh kind of like the same thing we talked about earlier that you know you go you give everything you can and that kind of fight and you still lose and you're the older fighter which of course she is uh she, and she's got a lot of miles on the odometer and you lose. There's like nothing else to give. And it's kind of very, as I said, parallel to what we just finished talking about. Where I talked about, you know, in a way, you know, fight uh, with Donaire. Where, you know, the, the older champion, the older former champion fighting uh, the younger fighter uh, after the first fight was great. The second fight is not great. Because there's nothing left for the older fighter to give, mentally or or physically. So I think it's kind of in line with that. But uh, Wiley, I mean, Joanna paid a price for being overly aggressive. Um, you know, we love her. Everyone loves her because of her aggression and her fighting style. And they should. She's a warrior. But she was over aggressive. She walked into that backhand, that you know, that backhand punch of Wiley, and it was a smart move by Wiley. And I always talk about that. I talk about with these fighters, they're all tough for the most part. But the ones who are technically better, a little smarter, if you will, they separate themselves. They do. That's what it's about. And Wiley separated herself. Uh, she She's also so strong. You know, she immediately got the geography that she wanted on the mat. Uh, where she could use her abilities there, her strength there. And as I said, in the end, uh, and you said, you know, one shot out. The only thing I add to it is that Joanna, as you said, retired. And I just want to say for all of us, congratulations to, to her for a great career. And she taught many what a champion looks and acts like. And I say bravo, bravo, because... I sent a tweet out before the night about this fight, and it was one of the uh, 
uh, main event fights, uh, and I and I said that we already know, obviously, that both these fighters from their careers, from their first fight, obviously know how to fight. But what we know most important is they know how to behave like fighters, like warriors. And Joanna did that every bit of the way. So again, thank you for everything that you've given us. That's it. Well, we'll segue right into uh, from one incredible uh, female performance into another, Valentina Shevchenko, who's almost been untouchable for uh, seemingly as long as I can remember, just running through people the bullet she's an actress she just seems like the salt of the earth always positive attitude kicking ass taking names and just being a good person um she was in tough with taylor santos brazilian brazilian jiu-jitsu player um i heard dana saying like a lot of people are underestimating uh santos and i think that they were because this was as close as it gets you went um uh, Valentina wins a razor thin split decision. Uh, it just like on the feet, it was like the tale of two fights. On the feet, Valentina was just picking her apart, doing what she wants. When Santos got her on the ground, she had control of her most of the time, frustrating Valentina all night long. She was so close to pulling off the upset. I wouldn't be surprised if there's an immediate rematch. I think everyone loved the fight as good as it gets in terms of technicalities and different fight styles, ground fighter versus stand up, um, you know, each of them dominating on their, in their, uh, in, with, with their, to use your, one of your phrases, with their geography. But how'd you like this one? The contrasting styles. It was a great fight. Very close. I thought Santos was winning after the third. Uh, and uh, Shevchenko had to, behaved like a champion she had to dig down you know it's a great fight when the big favorite the champion has to dig down and uh one of the blueprints to pulling off an upset when you're the big dog like santos was is you have to have confidence you have to build confidence you have to find a place to get confidence santos went about that immediately winning the first two rounds and building that confidence and then she had a chance to really win because now she believes she could win now she had the confidence to pull off an upset against this great fighter, this great champion uh, that she was a big underdog against. So that's what she did. And she got that confidence to win. Uh, and she carried it. And uh, she got caught, Santos. That didn't help her. That, you know, that, that didn't help her, you know, for the night by getting cut over the eye the way she Yeah, they got a head clash and it swelled her eye almost shut too. Yeah, I mean, but hey, that's part of the game, part of the business, and part of what champions deal with. And she dealt with it. Uh, I'll tell you, shoot, to your point, uh, the geography for her on the mat, Ken, she was so fast and slick on that mat. It was incredible, you know, and, and, and strong, and, and strong. But my goodness... I mean, she got she got big arms than you. I mean, but she's strong. But, <laughs> that doesn't but, take much. Uh, no, 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 you're strong. <laughs> but she <laughs> she was so uh, she was like an eel. I mean, she got uh, on that floor, <laughs> bang, boom, bang, boom, gap, uh, and next thing you know, she's she's got the champion in a lot more trouble than she figured on being in uh, going into this fight. And again, she had to behave like a champion. Uh, to to witness and to her credit, to her credit, after the third round, like I said, I had I had Santos winning, and I and then Shevchenko had to change things. She changed the geography for the fourth and the fifth round, and she won the fourth round by doing that by changing up, and um, <laughs> she did what she had to do, and then you know. For me, whoever won the fifth was going to win it. And the fifth was a tough round too. But it, it, it looked like she, you know, like I said, she made that change in the fourth out of desperation. Out of not just desperation, out of need. Out of knowing what a champion has to know. That I got to change something here. You know, it's not going according to plan. And to keep my title. And she did. And she had the, the brains to do that the, under such tough condition to be able to think that way under those kind of that kind of environment that kind of stress that kind of threat yeah that's saying something that's saying something so some people thought santos won close fight 
Uh, and again, Shevchenko pulled it out late. Uh, you want to hear the scorecards? Oh, great credit to both fighters. Yeah, go ahead. Scorecards. Uh, Howard Hughes had it 48-47. Shevchenko. Shevchenko wins the fourth and fifth. Uh, David Leatherby had it 48-47 for Santos, but with um, Shevchenko winning four and five, all three judges had her winning four and five. Clemens Werner had it 49-46. He gave the first and second to um, Valentina when all the other two judges basically gave one and three. They all had one. They all had the third round for um, Santos. Two of the judges had him had her winning. Um, the second, but one of those judges had Shevchenko um, had Valentina winning four of the five rounds. I didn't see that. He only had gave Santos the third. Interesting scorecards. In line Razor with what coast. I, in line with what I yeah. just said, and how I yep. read the fight. You know that that yep. she came on late. She won the fourth. She pulled out the fifth. She won the fight late, and uh, uh, it was you know. It was a great fight. I think Santos earned the rematch. For sure. That was a fantastic fight. Well, keeping with the theme of fantastic fights, we get to arguably one of you the best. You remember the thrill in Manila, right, Ken? Of course. All right. This was the thrill in Singapore, okay? <laughs> the Singapore sling. I mean, this was deserving of having its own title. For Like they gave the titles of these great fights, you know, uh, the Rumble in the Jungle, this, that, all these different fights, the fight of the century, first phrase alley fight. But this deserves a title. That's how good it was. That's how special it was. That's how magnificent it was. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just had to add that. One of these days, I'm going to tell you the story when I was working in the prison and they and they told me to get into the isolation cell with an inmate who was refusing to be strip searched. And the warden said, Ken, get in there and take his clothes off him. And I, if I hope I've you ever said no. Sk- there was like there was like fifteen guards there. I was eighteen years old. I was with my friend Brendan Daly, who goes by the screen name Spooky Daly. Now he's a director and a musician, and we're both standing there. We had brought this kid down from uh, the dormitory building, and they were like, "Oh, you know, every time you move an inmate from building to building, they have to be strip searched." So they said to the kid, "Take your clothes off." And the kid was like, no, I'm not taking him off. It's standard practice. And the guy just looks at me, the warden, he goes, Ken, get in there and rip his clothes off, basically. I'm like, oh, God, please don't do this. Please. I'm thinking, I was like a fighter ready to go in and fight. I'm like, please let the lights go out. Let the building get struck by lightning, anything. I can't believe I'm doing this. And I was like, okay. And I went into the cell and I said, buddy, take your clothes off. This is the last one. And now I'm thinking, and they closed the door. So now we're locked in an isolation cell in the in a dungeon of this shithole prison and uh, thank God when they closed the door, the kid looked at me and just started taking his clothes off. But I, if, you, if you could have seen my heart, it, my heart rate must have been like 300. I was like, oh, Scared it's on. Crap, I can't huh? believe. Oh, I was You're like. right about you. Your, your reputation <laughs> polluted you. Um, you know, take your clothes. But, but the, the fans out there, guys, he, he's, he's being, you know, he's being modest. He's not telling you that he under his breath, very lightly, he said to him, but enough for the inmate to hear him. Take your clothes off before That's you fight. That's pretty much it. And then, like, no, no, but then underneath his breath, he, he said, before you find out why they call me. <laughs> why by they, the way, I would have done. Before you find I, out why they send for me in these situations. <laughs> before you find out why they call me Killer Ken. <laughs> Take your freaking clothes off, please. It was his, it was maybe the most scared I've ever been in my life, but it was one of those things where you're like, well, it's on now. I guess we're going to have to see what happens. I'm going to have to rely on like instincts because I do not want to do this. But and he, I had no emotional connection to this guy. I didn't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to get in a fight with someone for just for the sake of having a fight. But they were either. like, I think they were testing me. And I was like, okay, if this is what it comes to, like, maybe hopefully they'll testing, come in if I'm losing. Maybe he was testing you guys too, really. You know, I mean, yeah. the kid's under those conditions. And, and maybe you gave him a look. You know, that look, those dark eyes, those cold <laughs> eyes that are like Roberto Duran's. They're, they're just empty. They're just empty. <laughs> it was, man, that was so, I was thinking like the battle in the dungeon or something. But um, yeah, let's talk about one of the, arguably one of the best light heavyweight uh, title fights One of the greatest fights. fights. This history. is a big statement. You ready? One yep. of the greatest fights I ever saw. My son, Teddy, yep. was uh, called me up after the fight and... um. 
he 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 hadn't seen it, so he wanted to see if it was worth seeing. I said, Bud, one of the greatest fights I ever saw. He said, Wow. He said, That's enough. I'm in. He goes, That's <laughs> that's a big enough statement. One of the yeah. I mean, that's uh, it was it was Mickey Ward and 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 Gaddy won. Um, it was every bit of that, you know, because Theo Corrales won. Um, I mean, it was all of that, you know. Uh, it was it was as I've said before, Ken. It's like reading a book, and each round is a chapter, uh, a chapter of life. I mean, it was. Uh, uh, there were so many times when I, I was watching with my wife, I said, oh, Glover is going to lose this. And then the next thing you know, he takes him down. I'm like, where is he getting the energy? He looks like he can't even hold his hands up. And the next thing you know, he fires off a barrage and gets a takedown. And there's then, an X and factor, Pohosk, though. There's an X factor. Yeah. You know why I say it's one of the greatest fights I ever saw? The was guy that? doing this was 42 years old. <laughs> it's so now, think it's about crazy that. to equate, even hear. You have to equate that into you know, into it. You have to put that in. You have to. He was 40. It'd be extraordinary if he was 22. But he was he 42. 10 years ago. 42 10 years, years ago, old. 10 years ago, he was working as a landscaper in my neighborhood in Westchester. He worked for the guy who cut my grass. You, ten, you knew enough years. not to start a fight with him, right? You knew enough oh, not no, to was, say, the hey, guys. you missed some weeds over there. <laughs> I, I never do that to anyone. I just oh. go out and pick up the weeds myself. The um, Yeah, but this kid, he's like been, he's just been sticking around, constantly trying. And it's like one of the oldest cliches, like you don't know if you don't try. And he just keeps trying, keeps trying. The thing that sucks for Glover is when you're the champion, you get the pay-per-view points. So this was probably the biggest, the first and biggest pay uh, pay-per-view payday he's ever had and all he had to do was survive 28 more seconds and he at, the, at a minimum looking at the scorecards he gets a draw which means he gets another pay-per-view fight I, it was heartbreaking no no for he him. doesn't I get a draw he, he doesn't get a draw he gets a win he was ahead on the well, scorecards no, he was ahead on the scorecards score correct yourself he was ahead on the scorecards going into so the it, fifth it, it was a draw. One guy had a draw going into the fifth. Go ahead, go ahead. One guy had Glover. One one guy had Glover up by two rounds, yep. two points, and one guy had Glover up by one point. So if if it's he, a one point, he wins. hold on. If it's a one point, if Pohaska wins, he was that winning that round, round though. He was winning that round though. Yeah, I mean, but when if he it, finishes, it went, all, it if he went off the cliff. Quick. If he doesn't get choked out and the guy just pummels him, and let's just say Pohaska wins the fifth, p potentially. If, right, if he okay. doesn't choke him out, if he if he chokes him, if he if he beats him up and doesn't win, he gets he goes up by one point on one scorecard. He can't He's lose. down by one point. And he um and he is and it's a tie for so he gets and he, keeps a, the title. he gets Hold on. Pohaska will win by one on one card, get a draw on another, and he'll lose on one. So he would have got a, a split draw. Like yeah. one guy had him winning, one guy That's had him losing. That's what I'm saying. He one. couldn't lose. He couldn't yeah, lose. Yeah, no, he couldn't lose, but he, he could have got. Yeah, so I'm saying, at worst case, he gets a draw no matter what. But he would have had, no matter what happens, if he survives that round, even if he loses, he gets a draw. Ken, he gets a rematch. You know he whole, gets another payday. No, but that's what I was saying. The whole thing, the whole thing really hung on he made a strategic mistake in the last round he heard him he is he heard him striking badly 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 and he backed him into the ropes and Prozanka was really really in bad shape and Texera made a decision to take him to the floor to take him to the mat if he stayed on his feet I'm gonna say I don't care I know that I'm not an MMA lifer but I'm a fight lifer I'm gonna say he wins that. He he stops him, but he and I know how tough Poshaka uh, is. I I understand what he survived all night and how special he showed himself to be. I get all of that, but Texera made a mistake taking him to the floor, and it was his instincts. It was a split instinct because that's his strength to go to the mat, and that's what everyone thought in this fight he had to do. They all thought he had to go to the mat because he's so strong and good at grappling that he had to take away Prasaka's striking abilities and as you know his youth in, in that way he could strike fast, where he was dimensional, um, explosive, 
um, even unorthodox a little bit, but very explosive. Uh, that he had to take, you know, he had to quell some of that explosiveness, that multi dimension of his on on the striking where he took him to the floor and killed some clock and used his grappling and his physical strengths down there, you know, to give himself a chance to beat this young, tremendous fighter. And um that's what everybody thought was the blueprint going in. And the funny thing, you know, sometimes funny things happen on the way to the uh to the octagon where what really happens is it turns out that he's an underrated Texera is an underrated striker and that his physical strength he's so damn strong equates to striking as well as to an advantage on the floor when he's grappling because he can punch like a son of a gun and also his mind his experience where he was calm enough in the late rounds he was calm enough to to see what he had to do, to see what punches had to be thrown. And he used his timing. His experience brought that along. But Texero can use his timing to negate the speed, to, to overtake the speed advantage that Prozaka had on him, where he timed him with beautifully placed right hands that were devastating devastating most guys would have got knocked out and he hurt him with that so here's the ironic part he's supposed to be on the mat to have a chance to win his meanwhile he's standing and his best chance to win turns out to be standing where nobody thought that was it and he's got this guy on the brink of a knockout and he goes to the place instinctively where everyone thought he needed to go to, to the floor. But he didn't need to at that time. He shouldn't have. He made it strategic, and he did it twice in the last round. Because after they got up, he went back to strike, and he hurt him again. And then he took him to the floor again. So he really made two strategic mistakes that cost him keeping the title. It really did. But all the credit to put... Prochaka. Am I saying them right? Pro Pro Haka. Pro Haka. I'm sorry. There you uh, go. Um, pro let me let me write that. I down. think pro that's it. I mean ha the two of us aren't exactly the no. kings of pronunciation, no, no, but I think that it's Pro Haka. I'll go with you. Yuri. Uh, like, ha <laughs> ha <laughs> so <laughs> So anyway, Pro Haka, to his credit, he earned being champ, not just because of his physical skills. Going back to what we talked about with Belanga and all that stuff. Listen, he proved he's got the it factor. He's proved that he is mentally strong. He proved that he's not physically only strong, and he is. And he did a great job. He showed how strong he is and dimensional he is on striking and on the mat. But the most important strength he showed the one he needed to win this title against this very special man. Texas, I say it again. This very special 42-year-old man. <laughs> He's the George Foreman of UFC. He To beat this man, it wasn't enough that he just had power. For, for Pachaga to beat Texera, he needed the strength, the inner strength. The strength where when you do a CAT scan... You look into the guy's intestines. That has to be there. When you looked into his intestines, and he went through a cat scan in this fight, he he did not get out of this fight free. There was a cat scan put on him by Texera to look into his intestines, and there was the stuff that had to be there. That had to be there. And if it wasn't there, he loses. He had to have that special stuff that Texera had. He had to have what we talked about that Belanga doesn't have. Doesn't have yet at least. He had to have that. Where he was able to go into a dark room. A room he'd never been in before. A chamber that was unknown to him. And find a light switch. Find it. And he did and not everyone could do that. They can be strong. They can be fast. They can be all the things in 
uh, you know, have the intellect under pressure. They they can be multidimensional, but they don't all have that. If he doesn't have that, if Poshanka doesn't have that, he's not champion today. He's not champion today. He had to have that special quality, that inequality, that real strength. That is real strength. He had to have that. And um, he refused to submit. He refused to be diminished in his mind, to lose his confidence. He refused. He refused when the boogeyman came. He said, get the F out of here. When the devil came to the door, <laughs> and the devil comes to everyone's door, Ken. The devil comes to everyone's door. When he came, he get the F out of here. You're not wanted here. You're not allowed here. Get out of here. He locked the door the way the great warrior Vander Holyfield used to do. When, when it came to him, he locked the door. And some people don't lock the door, Ken. It's that, that's the truth. That's the truth in life, okay? And that's the difference in life. And that was the difference. If he didn't have that, he doesn't beat this great man, this great Texera. And I hope they both got bonuses from our man, Dana, because they sure as hell, I'm sure they did. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure they did. No, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. The best thing he could do is give him a rematch. And he won't, it won't be close. It'll be the same thing I said before. This great yep. man, Texera, did everything he could, and he still lost. He did make a mistake, though, but he still lost, and he's 42 years old. And you know what? As great as he is, it'll be like Jersey Joe Walcott, the second time with Marciano, Alexis Oquello, the second time with Aaron Pryor. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll be the same as it was with Donaire, the second time with Inouye, and it, that the the great former champion did everything he could the first time with this younger champion, this special young, and he won't be able to bring it back. He, it'll be gone. It'll be left in the ring, mentally and physically. It'll be left in the ring, and people will be shocked. It'll be a one-round fight, and people will be shocked. Now, does he deserve to, he spe- does he deserve the chance to get that? Yes. 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 He deserves it. He deserves anything he wants. <laughs> he should be the guy that anything he asked for, you know, anything he asked for in in that uh in you know in that company, uh, he should. You, you want yes, Mister Texera, what would you like? Uh, you want eggs and coffee with uh, with two scoops of sugar? Yeah. Uh, what else do you want? Oh, you want a pork chop with those eggs? Yes, yes, Mister Texera. Speaking he of get speaking of. Anything you Speaking want. Speaking of that, did you like the way Joanna Jenchacek, after she retired, I thought one of the classiest things she did was call out all the people that work at the UFC because that's one thing that never really gets a lot of buzz in the press. Is, and from talking to some of the fighters like Dustin Poirier, the people that work on that stuff behind the scenes, and we know Markel Martin started his career as a UFC employee before he went on to be Francis Ngannou's manager at CAA. And it seems like they've got world-class people working behind the scenes that go above and beyond to help the fighters with whatever they need. And I'm sure there's probably some fighters that are disgruntled, but the feedback I've always heard is that there's world-class people there. And it was really nice of Joanna to give them a special shout out as she was thanking Dana and Lorenzo and the Fertitta brothers to highlight the employees at the UFC. Cause there's a lot of people that work there. hundred percent, but I'm not shocked. If she's got the character to do the things she does in that difficult domain, she's got the character to do it everywhere, you know, and, and th- there's strength in caring about others. I always say that. There's a certain inner strength about caring beyond yourself, your own spear. There's a strength. When you can care about others, not just yourself, but others, there's a power to that. There's a strength to that. There's a care to that. And that care equates into strength. Yep. Well, there's a couple other fights on that main card that I know you wanted to touch on quickly. Starting with the young prospect, Jack Della Madonna. Della Della Madalena from uh, Australia was in tough against Ramazan Emiv. And uh, Russian wrestler background, kind of that from that uh, Khabib type style, and one of the and and Jack uh, Della Madalena is a big striker, and in a crazy twist, you know this kid Madalena is on a twelve fight win streak, but he literally lost his first two professional UFC fights, and since then has just been on a complete tear. And if I'm not mistaken, let me just check here. I think he stopped everyone. 
He stopped every single fighter. Oh, no, one, one unanimous decision out of his 12-fight win streak on Dana's uh, contender series. But his first two fights in the... Uh, in the UFC, in the main, sh in the big show, he wins by first round knockout. He was in there, like I said, tough against a Russian wrestler who was putting it on him early, and uh, he had him in a, I don't know what kind of choke it was, the uh, boa constrictor choke. I don't know. He had him in like an arm triangle choke, and I thought it was in tight. And this, that's what these Russian guys are known for. But but credit to Jack, he didn't uh, he didn't tap. He got out of it and came back, got back up and knocked him out cold. What an unbelievable performance! How'd you like it? He did a little Volkanovski over there, you know. He escaped. Mm -hmm. He was a uh, he escaped. That's exactly he, right. Uh, what he had to escape there, but uh, he was smart enough to escape, good enough, tough enough, resilient enough to escape what he had to escape, and then to get to the geography that made sense for him to stay away from there and get to the striking. And he's a good striker, and he was reminiscent to me. Uh, of Mickey Ward with that left hook to the liver. I mean, perfectly placed, debilitating shot. It takes, it just removes everything from your body. It shuts your body down. I mean, and he shut him down. He shut him down with one well played. He was putting his punches together tonight, and then all of a sudden, bang! He set up that left hook to the to the liver, to the liver. That's where it is, and it just it it turns the lights out in the body. The electric current stops going you know, uh, to the legs and the, the pain is excruciating and it, it's just one of those debilitating punches. And um, I tell you, he's a guy I want to see more of because of that style, because of that punch, because of that ability to get to the geography that suits him better. So that's, uh, that was tremendous. Yeah, and then the fight after that, uh, the second card fight on the main card, Andre Fialo in with Jake Matthews. Jake Matthews gets the um, second round knockout halfway through the round. How'd you like that one? Matthews, to me, was so impressive all night because he was floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee. He really looked like a top high-end boxer. He really did. He really, that's why I put out that tweet. And by the way, I want to thank uh, Ian Mackey. Oh, uh, man. Uh, you know, Rob wasn't able to do my tweeting. Uh, can you <laughs> believe it? He went to a, a wedding. Or he went out with his wife. And, <laughs> and he, he didn't stay home to do my tweeting. You believe that, Ken? You believe that? <laughs> he knows better than to yeah. go out on a Saturday night. You know, you believe that? So anyway, um, no, but Ian, all kidding aside, Ian is is special guy and he filled in for Rob which he's done before and he put my tweets up and you know I almost feel embarrassed when, when I have him do it because he's a genius you know the guy's a genius and it's kind of like having a like a, a molecular scientist prune your bushes you know what I mean like <laughs> like, like that, that's how I feel I'm being honest and he's and a I, great kid and I got him doing my and he is he's a genius and I got him doing my uh my tweets, but he's a gracious kid, and he 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 enjoys it, and he enjoys this game, and I think he enjoys uh, our, our podcast, thankfully, and he got it up there, and he told me at one point, and Rob uh, too, that that night, because of the greatness of the fight, the tweets got extraordinary numbers. I mean, he yep. told he told me he said Teddy by tomorrow, half a million people or somewhere in that vicinity will have seen your tweets. I was like, wow, you are a molecular scientist. Wow. I mean, that <laughs> you know, he works with the great, he, he actually does work with the brainiac, Andrew Huberman, neuroscientist at Stanford. And, uh, yeah. And those guys make an awesome team. And I got to be honest, Rob, they call him Rob behind the scenes, the pod father. Rob knows how to produce a podcast and he knows how to direct PR. He's the, Rob has become the wizard of, of podcasts. And uh, I'm sure that those guys would, would agree. Well, I mean, that's why they're with him. And Matthews, yep. Matthews was, as I said, uh, I was very impressed. And just the way he flow, literally, literally, and I put that up in a tweet, he was floating so easily, so effortlessly. I mean, he was like the old timers used to tell me, and described to me about Joe DiMaggio in the outfield of Yankee Stadium that he was so graceful 
that when he, and the old timers will get this, where he used to track down a fly ball, it looked like he wasn't trying. You know, it looked like he was doing it effortlessly. And of course, it yeah. takes a big effort, but it looked like he wasn't. He was just out there eh, shagging flies. You know, that's, that's how graceful he was. And that's how this kid looked. He was just out there floating. And I noticed it, and I put it up there for that reason. And then I was very impressed with his finish, where he finished them. He was putting combinations together beautifully on, um, on, on Fialho, Fial and he was he had him you know in position near the ropes and he's putting the punches together but then he changed the eye level he he changed the level of the punch to the uppercut brilliant really it's what a fighter would do like a top end fighter he switched to the uppercut from the punches above where it was just the right choice at the right time and it finished fialo so i i was very impressed yeah, oh, like I said, awesome card. UFC delivers again from Singapore this time. Before we sign off, though, we'd be remiss if we didn't give a thorough breakdown and analysis of the upcoming Joe Smith Jr. versus the great Arter Better BF. I'm looking forward to this fight. The one thing you can be guaranteed of is there is going to be action. These guys are both super tough, con uh, unbelievably um, accomplished guys, and uh, both proud men and i'm looking forward to this fight what are you looking for oh uh, you're 100 percent right before we touched on that real quick i want to just mention since you're talking about upcoming fights i want to give for uh, you know our fans and brothers and sisters out there from the ufc the mma world just touch on two upcoming fights that caught my eye uh the other night which are just like you just described this boxing fight is extraordinary and it's it's going to be just it's going to be a house on fire but um Holloway and Volkanovski the third fight that that's what I'm looking for I just oh, that yeah. that I'm looking for it's going to be all about geography and um Holloway to me is one of the best strikers you're ever going to see Volkanovski is, is special just like Holloway is but they've both been on our air as guests. Uh, they're both special people. Volkanovski, I mean, that guy, uh, uh, you know, he's a zombie. You know what I mean? He dies and he stays alive. You know what I mean? Like in, in that fight where, uh, it look, I mean, really, he's supposed to be out. And, and then he goes into convulsions, self-created convulsions, uh, you know, to get out of it. And... Um, uh, he he's the Houdini of the MMA world. Um, he he's uh, the guy you <laughs> I, you can't kill a guy. Yeah, yeah, like he's a zombie. He's a, yep. yeah, he's unbelievable. And and Holloway is a great striker. Uh, as tough as they come to, as resilient as they come. I thought I love them both. I thought that Holloway won the second fight. Um, because a lot of people say, well, we're getting a third fight, but, you know, Volkanovski's 2-0. Yeah, he is. But I, I thought, I'm, I really did. I thought Holloway may have won the second fight. But either way, uh, it, it's it's a great one to look forward. And the other one is uh, Edwards and Usman, too. Edwards has been on our show, too. Uh, and and Usman, I, that's a great one. I'll tell you why. It's... Edwards has matured and gotten experience since the first one. He's a different fighter, a much different fighter now. And they're mirror images of each other. They're technically solid. They're physically strong. They're, they're, they're blue-collar types. They're Marvin Hagler. You know, just just really solid and dependable and really good, and and no, you know, uh, not none of those bells and whistle extra. You know, uh, just just like I said, just uh, just solid, uh, no frills guys. Um, the only difference, Usman is the you can't get around this. Usman is a version of him that is bigger and stronger. Because there's nobody bigger and stronger than Usman. So he is a little big and strong. But Edwards, again, they're, they're very similar. They, they do it by the book. They do everything technically right. They're dependable. Uh, they're straightforward. It's a very interesting fight. You got to favor Usman. There's no doubt about that. But I think it's an interesting fight. Go ahead. Get to the, get to the Smith and uh, better be a... 
Yes, for the guys at uh, my bookie, my book, check out mybookie.ag and use the promo code Atlas for a 50% credit on your first deposit up to $1,000. Right now on my bookie, live betting line is obviously better be a favorite, minus 700, plus 500 on Joe Smith Jr. Line seems a bit big for me. I think it's going to be closer than that, but I'm dying to hear your, uh, what you're looking for here. Yeah, Smith's got a chance. Better be should be the favorite. He's been a champion. He's a monster. These guys are real monsters. Um, and what did I say? What sells? Monsters and dinosaurs. So, um, yeah, it's going to sell. It should sell. Because you're, you you got guys that, they ne- they make no pretense about it. They're not pretty boys. These are guys, these are guys, uh, they're not stupid either. These guys are technically solid. Joe Smith has matured. He's gotten better. He's advanced. There's more room for Smith to keep getting better because he didn't have the background, the experience, the, the amateur experience. The better be have had about 300 fights, 400, whatever the heck it was. I think he won the world championships back in the amateurs one day. Um, but there's more. When you have that experience, there's not a lot of room to get better in certain areas. Um, but... For Smith, there's room to get better, and he has gotten better. And he's tough as nails, just like Better Be of physically strong, just like Better Be of good, f- solid, hard puncher with either hand, just like Better Be of. Uh, this this is uh, going to be, uh, you know, this is going to be a monster match. Like you, you're going to the monster trucks. You know what I mean. You're, you're not, you're not going to, you know, look at uh, those those uh, Ferraris and Porsches, maybe that go 200, 300 miles an hour. Uh, no, you're going to watch. If you're watching this fight, you're a fan of monster trucks, <laughs> monster trucks. You know, uh, not the Indianapolis 500 so much, and you're. You're not going to be disappointed. I don't see how you could be because these guys wouldn't know how to do anything else. They're going to go and test each other. They're going to test each other from their head to their toes. They're going to test and see see who can go to the darkest corners of themselves and still survive and still find a way and still come out on top. That's what these guys are going to do. Yeah, they're going to be smart as they can about it, technical as they can about it, buttoned up as much as they can about it. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you are what you are. You are what you are. Like Customato used to say to me, people born round don't die square, Teddy. Understand that. These guys were born round. They're going to fight round. And um, it should be a hell of a, uh, it should be a hell of a fight. Uh, body punching, pressure, aggression. Uh, you know, obviously, both guys, I wouldn't be surprised if they both visit the hurt locker, so to speak. <laughs> You know, before the night is over, uh, and who it might come down to who has the better chin, uh, you know, and and maybe just who's a little bit better, smarter at the right moment, you know, from a technical standpoint, and maybe even who uses their jab better. Uh, that that'd be. But again, again, at at the end of the day, you know, um, you're not eating sushi. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to a sushi <laughs> place. You're, you're, you're gonna going get, to uh, you go, Peter Lugas. You're, you're going to Peter Lugas, all right? You're going to Peter Lugas, and you're going to... I'll never forget. One time I went there years ago with a friend of mine. He brought his girlfriend at the time, and she was a little naive. And we're sitting there in Peter Lugas, and these, these old German waiters, Ken. You know, they're old, and they've been there forever. The place been there for, what, 150 <laughs> years, whatever. And, and it's a great landmark, right, in, in Brooklyn. And we're there, and everybody knows, right? Come on. You go to Peter you, you know what you're going, you're going there for, right? So what does yep. she say? What does she say? She says, <laughs> do you have fish? Uh do you have fish? Do you have? And the waiter looks at him, just dumbfounded, dumbfounded. He looked this big, strong German waiter. He looks at him. He says, "We have steaks, and you will eat steak." <laughs> just like that, scared the <laughs> crap out of her. You know, I think she lost <laughs> appetite. I'll be honest. Be honest with you. But just said, "We have steak. You will eat steak." When, well, it's like going to a sushi restaurant and ordering a cheeseburger. Yeah, that's what I mean. You, but that's what she did. That's what yeah, she I did. Know. And you will order, you will have steak. We have steak. 
So um, you're not you're not getting sushi, like I said. Uh, you're getting steak. You might get a side of potatoes, but you're getting steak, and uh, it should be a great one. It should be, and we'll be there with you guys to talk about, to break it down, um, you know, as we always are. And I just want to finish by saying thank you, guys, for you've been giving us, we, we went through a patch where we've been getting 1,000 new subscribers a day, which is, uh, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. On YouTube. Uh, on YouTube. And it's phenomenal. And please keep it up because that's the only way we can stay here and keep doing this. Uh, that's the only way that uh, that Ken will stay with me. Quite frankly, uh, Ken will <laughs> that's, not that's, stay. That's, Pre- that's not true. That, that's not true. That's I'm the, here till I'm here until Teddy fires me. I, I mean, and, uh, that's the, if you're you. watching thank this you. on YouTube, the, please you. hit the subscribe button. Honestly, it does help us. Obviously, please. for obvious reasons, thank right? You. It helps and us with you. advertisers. It lets people know what kind of reach we have, and we love sharing the uh, our opinions. We're and at two hundred and sixty three thousand subscribers. That's not bad. That's pretty darn good, and, and because mm, of you, not bad at because all. of the fans. Thank you. That's right. That's right. And for the fans, special offer from our number one sponsor, Athletic Greens. I love this stuff. They've been with us from the start. If you like the show and you care about your health, go check out a subscription to Athletic Greens. These guys have spent 10 years working with the top doctors, nutritionists to develop this whole food sourced ingredients. So if you're on the if you're on the run or you're not on the run, taking Athletic Greens ensures that you get all your fruits and vegetables for the day. One small scoop, mix it with water. I literally just shake it around in the shaker it comes with. It's, it couldn't be easier. It tastes great. It's good for you. It's like an insurance policy for your body's health and immunity system. Please check it out. Go to athleticgreens.com. Use the promo code ATLAS, athleticgreens.com slash ATLAS or promo code ATLAS. I'm not sure which one it is, but you'll figure it out and you'll get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. They're indispensable. Take them with me everywhere I go. So if you're traveling, take the travel packs, athleticgreens.com. Please check them out. Subscribe to the show and check out an order of oh, Athletic Can Greens. I add one thing to that? Yes. And only because it just hit me that it's real. I can't add it because it's happening. Um, I went on a diet two weeks ago. I, I was going to wait a while, but hearing you do that, I said maybe this is a great spot to die. I went on, I need to, I need to. I went on a diet, I've lost six pounds, and Athletic Greens is part Good of my for you. You know, part of my diet, part of what helps me get through the day when I want to skip a meal and do this and, you know, or, or just have a little extra energy to get to where I got to get to. But um, I've lost six. I've lost six. It's, I got, it's been about two weeks. I got a long way to go. Um, I want to lose 30. I want to lose 30. You can do it. I want to lose 30. You can lose, you can lose as much as you want because you're dependable. You're dependable to yourself. And I always tell people, take care of your health and fitness and nutrition like your life depends on it because guess what? It does. And you know you can count on you and you'd give yourself the same advice if you were training you. There's no excuses. Just stop with the bullshit. Get serious. Little exercise, good diet. You'll be a middleweight champion in no time. You got this. You're, you're the middleweight champ. I, I might have to move down a, a <laughs> class to avoid you because I, I don't want to. <laughs> well, Everyone you look out great, there. and I know Thank you're you. going to do it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back with an uh, interview with El Presidente Dave Portnoy, hopefully this Thursday. So please stay tuned, and um, thanks for being with us. Continue to like and subscribe to the show. It helps us immensely. Really appreciate you guys. Have a great week. 